Good morning, this is Vaughan Smith at westcoatbellpottery.ca on the coast of Nova Scotia. Um, I've got a few things to show you this morning. Mostly it's about putting handles on, um, but uh, a couple of other things I'll leave lay it till the end. So I'm gonna bring you over to where I'm gonna pull my handles. Um, my cat's sleeping with me this morning. All right, let's see if we can set it up just here. Yep, that looks like it should work. I got my water just down here. Um, I'm not sure if this will hold it. Maybe I should tilt the camera down a touch. Okay, so you can't see my head so much. All right, um, basically this is B-Mix, which is a cone five clay, but I fire it to cone six. Um, and um, I've got to pull a lot of handles. I have a whole bunch of them right here. I've got 28 mugs to put handles on um, and a couple of tankards with a different clay body. But this, it's just going to be dipped in water, makes it slippery, wet my hand, and then just start gently stroking down this piece of clay. This was just about a pound and a half of clay that I'm just turning it around. My hand is forming an oval shape. Keep your hand wet. So about every five pulls down, you probably need to wet your hands. I've already pulled enough handles, so I'm just doing this as a little demonstration. But I'll make a couple with this just so you can get the idea. Keep turning it around and keep wetting your hand. The thinner the clay gets, the more you often will have to wrap you know, moisten your hand down a bit because the clay will snap if you don't. But at the moment it's so thick it won't snap. So you can see it without much pressure at all, just stroking the clay, it's basically getting longer. Turn it around. Now your knuckle, depending on the shape of your hand, will give you a different shape handle. Um, I've had people that end up with a completely round handle doing it this way. Mine always has this groove down the center like that. And that's from my lump of fat in my hand, I guess. That actually gives it that. And my thumb on the other back side does a similar groove. And I, that's a characteristic, basically, of your handle. So your handles will have your character and personality in them. So I think that's a nice thing to have a different shape handle. And when people identify my pottery in the future, they may look for that. See, now it's getting thin. Not much pressure, I'm stroking the clay. If you put pressure on, you'll snap it off. And keep wetting your hands. And look at your mugs to judge the size for where you have to snap it off. And then just scrape the moisture off your finger and thumb so when you snap it off, it doesn't slip out of your hands because it'll stick to your finger at that point. And then once you've got one off, the next one you only have to stroke the bottom area and it will actually make another handle much quicker. So this is a very quick way of making a lot of handles, because once you've got it started, you can make one about every 15, 20 seconds. So I'm just snapping them off. Some water again. You can tell when it starts to drag on your fingers that you need to wet the clay again. Oh, don't forget to drag the water off your fingers. You'll know when you didn't because the handle will slip right out of your hands. All right, so I now have a couple of extra handles there. That's always good to have, but I won't destroy this in case I need something later on. So I'll just lay that by the side of them. And then I'll give you a quick look at something else I'm doing and then I'll show you how to put the handles on. My mugs are in good shape. They've been stored all night in a damp cupboard. 
I always keep a sponge while I'm working just so I can clean my hands quickly as well because the phone might ring. All right, so let me just show you what I'm doing over here. This is kind of a, a bit of a studio uh, slight tour, I guess. These are pots that I just refired that have been sitting in my gallery. Um, Nobody paid any attention to them, so they were dull. Um, so I just refired them and I put a very thick coat and these were just a gray blue bowl. Um, and I put a really thick coat of my oatmeal over the whole piece. Now these are already glazed, so they were shiny. So what I did was I used Epsom salts diluted in water. The recipe for that's online for the proportions. Thickened the glaze so much that when I dipped the pot, I had to literally bang it down with my tongs holding it on the tongs hitting the bucket edge to actually get the glaze to come off because it was very thick. And so that's how to glaze, reglaze something that has actually been fired already uh, and make the glaze stick to the surface. But now they've come out with this really nice texture oatmeal look. So I think these might have a better chance of selling now because they were nice balls, but they were gray with a dull blue over the top. Um, the same with this. This was a nice blue teapot. Uh, and it actually had sat there. We don't know why. Sometimes pots sell straight away. But I decided to do the same with this and the oatmeal. And now it has this amazing oatmeal sort of sort of lizard skin type texture almost, I guess. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, that has a better chance now, I think, of selling. And I did that to all of these. This was a sort of variegated blue, which is a sort of a dull gray. Uh, but then I did that on the top. Now I think it has a better chance of selling. It just livened the piece up. So, um, so I have a whole bunch of these, and that's what I did with all of them. I basically uh, thought they were a bit dull. This one was this color, and, and I dipped it in the blue again, and then the oatmeal. Uh, oh no, I did this one in Strontian Crystal Magic, down to there, and then dipped the oatmeal down to there, and that really livened it up and all that. So there's a nice little laws. All right, so um, if your studio showroom looks a bit dull, you can refire things. And I only had one thing that didn't work as well in the entire firing, and the oatmeal slipped down on this one. So I might try the firing this a third time. But, um... Okay, now, as a future thing for 2021, I bought myself a little test kiln um, because I'm firing a lot of test firings like the Strontium Crystal Magic, firing the whole kiln load as a test, which is kind of risky, um, as you see from one of the videos where a lot of the glazes ran. So I bought a test kiln and I only used it once now, um, but I'm going to do a whole bunch of tests on that uh, uh, Randy's Red Glaze uh, with my Strontium Crystal Magic and also the uh, oatmeal that I have, so I can give myself something a bit more interesting, just a simple glaze test. And this one was done in a super long cooling cycle, um, and of course it has no red in it whatsoever, and the glazes have matted over quite a lot and all that. But this is my first test with Randy's Red. I will post the firing cycles, um, because it is really sweet. I mean, it's a very nice piece, but um, but I think this one had a very short soak at cone six, 11 minutes, and then I slowed the cooling cycle down uh, and soaked it uh, 200 deg 2,000 degrees for 30 minutes and then slowed the cooling all the way down to 1750 and cooled it very slowly or from 1750 to 1600 uh, degrees. So, um, and it really has, it looks very different to the ones I did with this glaze on in the tests before. So firing cycles really will change a glaze, but it's still really pretty. And um, but anyway, I will keep you posted on these. Eventually I'll post a whole video on all the tests. I'm probably gonna do about six for each um, glaze just to see how it changes. Okay, let's go put some handles on. But um, 
There's a pigeon. Oh, and a seagull. Yeah, I, they, they, they stay with me all day. My, my audience. Okay, I'll have to get this just right. Oh, my cats have both decided to join me now. This is a little awkward to get, ah, there we go. I don't know how long they'll stay there for. Hi, little guy, this is Mirandi, and he's an old man. These are from yesterday. I just dipped them upside down in a bucket of water to wet the tops again. But I store my pots overnight in a damp cupboard so they don't dry out completely. And they're still, now they're bendable a little bit. You've got to make sure that you, when, you, when you put handles on, that you can actually bend the pot fairly easily. So I just, I can spray them or I can actually um, just dip them upside down in water. See how easy that is to move bend now? So I'm leaving a fingerprint in the surface of the clay. Um, and if I want to just add a bit more water, we can do that. That's perfect. You don't want to get them as soft as when you threw them because it'll dent the pot. That's perfect. So all I did was dip them upside down and that made them uh, sort of bendable again. Um, the key is just if you can do that and get clay on your finger, you know it's good enough to do. And that was at the bottom, the same at the top. It leaves a little bit of clay on your hand. Uh, now these handles are freshly pulled 15, 20 minutes ago, some of them, and the rest of them two, three minutes ago, I guess. Um, so they're very soft, but I'm only putting a small handle on uh, and therefore, uh, there's no weight to really make it sag. Um, all right, so, and then you'll know, if you make thin handles, they will sag. So you'll know if you've got your clay handles too thin. All right, so the end is where I pinched it off, so it's a bit funny. So just compress the end so that you've got a nice, flat, fairly even join. All right, and then where it was bendable and it's a bit sticky, you place it where you want it to be, and that should be about a half a centimeter to a centimeter from the top of the mug. And that's not like a, a rule you have to follow. That's for me. Um, it's for just the proportions I've always done because I put a little ball of like a little stamp thing on the top there. Um, and then, can you see this? Yep, okay. You have to kind of hold it at the point where you think it's gonna be the furthest out and then bring it in and look at it to make sure you can get at least two or three fingers inside that space and then just move it around. Take a look at it to make sure it's kind of straight. One of my eyes may be a little stronger than the other because I've often moved my handle over without even seeing it. So I have to compensate. And then I've touched, moved it around. We know it's really sticky at the bottom. And then I snap it off and leave a little bit, which I then turn over. Then these mugs are gonna have a layer of slip over the top of them. Um, and I've noticed over the years that if you put slip into a, a V-shaped gap like that, you will end up getting a thicker layer of slip there, which shrinks more because it's thicker and it will pull apart and have a little crack showing up. So what I do is I make a little wedge of clay, which I place into that gap and then basically, as I smudge this in, I'll have more of a curve rather than a V in that location. So, so I'll show you that repetitively now. 
And I also do my handles on boards like this without handling the mugs because they are soft. Because I actually will be putting a layer of slip on these. I need the, hand, the clay pots to be fairly soft as I put the slip on. So flatten it. Place it centimeter to a half a centimeter from the top. I move it up and down, side to side until I know it's stuck. Hold it at the corner and pull in. Take a look and just kind of judge that you can get two, three fingers in. Every customer requests something about a handle. They're very important to people. So I like to make sure they can get their fingers in. Now, fold over that bit there. The bit that's left over, I snap a little piece off. And then I make this little wedge. Keep a sponge with you at all times too when you're doing this because your fingers will get really messy and it's good to clean your fingers off every so often. There you go, my little wedge, which I place inside the join like that. And then get another handle and we'll do the same. Now they are slippery. If it's a bit too wet on the top, you can just drag it over the sponge. Basically flatten the top area. I try to work with mugs three to six on a bat. Sometimes I do two if they're slightly bigger. Um, and that way it speeds the process up. Remember, this should be easily movable and you should leave a fingerprint because that way you know the clay is soft enough to accept another piece over the top and, and stick easily. Up and down, side to side, up and down, side to side. And that way you know it's And I did that three, four, five times there. So make sure it's joined and take your handle. The gra gravity will keep it sort of vertical fairly straight so then you bring it in and you take a look at it and you may have to push this up and down to get the size you want and then basically just eyeball it and like I said one eye is stronger than the other for me but um, basically it'll be pretty straight I think customers and I like to enhance the handmade quality of my pieces too so but I think customers will actually appreciate that all right a little piece of clay wedge shape try and keep it even too stick it in between all right now my mugs are narrow at the top because it keeps the coffee warm so i use a brush that's just dipped in water and my thumb has got a little moisture on it I put the brush, make sure you don't dig through the clay. So I kind of brush in towards the handle and then using my thumb, I just push in and then smudge over. So the pressure is coming back from the brush on the inside. Move to the next one, push in. It's very soft clay down here, so it sticks easily. Move to the next one. Remember, bring your brush towards so it doesn't dig the bristles into the, make a hole in the inside of your coffee mug with the bristles being fairly stiff. They're not that stiff, it's a fairly soft brush, but you still, I've seen brush dig into the clay because it's quite soft there. Now, everybody will have a brush they prefer to do something with. This is slightly smaller than the other one. All right. But they're sort of flattened brushes. What I do is I push down with the metal part of the paintbrush. It's just wet a little bit, but it's not wet enough to dribble water. And I smooth that little that little piece of clay, the wedge shape, I smooth it downwards to push it into the gap and then smooth it over. So now I'm getting that little curve there. Here you go, this one's still wet enough so I can. I don't need to dip it in water again. So I'm pushing it into the little gap. Now if you didn't have slip on these, you wouldn't have to do this. But because I'm going to actually put a layer of slip over the entire piece, and I'll do some stenciling as well, then I do have to do that so the slip doesn't dribble in there. Now the top, there's a cat hair there. At the top I use the heel of the brush 
to come underneath and basically I have to do it so you can still see I'm just smoothing in all the way around with the heel of the brush just where the bristles touch the actual paintbrush so you've got bristles to metal and it actually smooths it out all right so they wet it a little bit now so same with this one use the heel of the brush where the bristles go in to the arm of the brush and you basically smooth it down and around and then wet it again same again heel of the brush underneath it's already stuck but you've got an actual you know line where you can see where it joins my wife just came so my cat's running to go see her Right, so using the heel of the brush to push the clay in, basically. Now you can see it's fairly fast to do this. I'm slowed that slowed down because I'm showing this, but I can put handles on very fast doing this technique. And then it's all about just brushing away any fingerprints you might have created on the actual surface of the clay and shaping it a little bit. What I'm going to make with these are those blue sailboat mugs you've seen in my showroom videos. I almost sold out of those before Christmas. I've only got like a handful left. So anywhere you touch the rim, you'll notice there'll be a mark wherever your paintbrush or your finger touch the rim. You've got to brush that away. And use the brush to do the curve too. I like to have a, a, a nice round curve. You can get three fingers in my mugs most of the time, unless you've got large hands. And you can see that the curve profile is almost the same on every mug. That one's got a little bit showing up there. So just pay attention to detail and then just make sure it's nice and smooth. And then, you, you'll notice on my mugs if you purchased one or if you've actually seen in the videos that I always make a round ball. I don't use a stamp on the bottom of my pieces. Uh, a lot of potters will just make a stamp that's made out of clay. Um, I actually you know I have a friend in Ohio, Balm Pottery, that um, uses a little tree and a little stamp and that's his signature for his pieces. Um, and um, But I, ever since I started making pottery, you know, in the North, North American continent, anyway, in England, I didn't do it, but um, uh, I've always signed my pieces because I wanted people to find me. Um, and you would need a professional to search up uh, a stamp. There was a symbol, say, of Mike's pottery, which is Mike Baum has a little tree stamp. Uh, because somebody in Ohio might know that because he lives there, but somebody in Florida may not. Um, and so I want people to find me easily. Let me show you what stamp I do have. I use a stamp on my handles. It's not my signature, but it's a little spiral. And I brush it on a dusty surface and then basically just press it in to give my thumb a place to rest. And that's, I've called it a home for the thumb, but it's just a little place where your thumb can touch and it has a slight texture. So it makes people feel comfortable. Um, so even though I don't sign my, I don't stamp my pieces on the bottom, I do have that. So people in the future would see that and probably say, oh, that's Vaughan Smith Westco Bell Pottery. Uh, but that would be a professional who knows what he's looking for. The everyday person on the street who has purchased pieces of pottery or, you know, in 50, 100 years time, I already have pieces on auction sites, which I'm always amazed to see. But um, so people are reselling our work already. Um, there you go. And then the last minute, I just give a sponge over the top there to kind of smooth out. Uh, but there's a quick way of putting some handles on. Now, I have a quick demo here. What if somebody doesn't? find it comfortable to make handles the way I've just shown you. Uh, if you practice, I would be very surprised if you couldn't get good at that. 
Uh, but some people get disheartened very quickly about things. Um, and so maybe they would like a simpler way that's more hand building. Um, let's get a piece of clay here. Move my handles. So I've got a couple of different ways I can show you here. This is a ball of clay. I find this harder than the way I do handles. But here you go, a ball of clay. Roll it into a coil. Can you see what I'm doing? Yep. Don't dig your fingers in the pots you got in front of you either. I nearly did that. So I've just rolled a coil that's thinner at one end and thicker at the other. All right, thicker and thinner. I have this, which I can then create a texture. And I have different paddles. I've got a really wide one of these. Um, but that's one way of doing it. And then all you have to do is flatten the end up there and join it in the same way that I just showed you how to do those. Because there's a, a little hand-built handle. That was quick to do, and it might be quite as quick as the other process I've just shown you. Um, so that's probably just as good. All right, let's go with the next one. I don't like this method myself, but it is easy. Make sure you can see what I'm doing. This is your regular trimming tool, loop tool. And if you dig it into your clay and keep the piece of wood gliding on the surface, and then pull your clay apart, and this is why I don't like this technique. It just seems fiddly. Well, it doesn't want to do that either. But you can then pull your handle out. See, I don't like this technique. This is why. But I guess maybe if I'd got a piece of clay out of the... And then you lay it down, uh, a square piece, then you get it down onto a thing like this. And you smooth out what you pulled. This technique always makes me think it's just too finicky. But it works. And like I said, some people will get really good at this. I don't do this, I mean, so it's like I'm a beginner at this stuff. Okay, I got a handle though. So basically I, oh, I can join this onto the pot, but I would say that's your last resort to do it this way. So I have to flatten the edge a little bit, make it a little thicker at the top there. And you can actually use that as a handle. All right, so it's basically my least favorite way of doing this. And um, because it wastes a lot of clay too. So, um, but anyway, put it back in there and you can reuse the clay anyway. Um, don't want clay to dry out. So bang it back into a ball. There's a little bit left over there, which I might use on the rest of my handles anyway. Um, so that's basically the handle type thing. I've shown that last winter one of the first videos i did last winter i think i was showing you how to do handles set up right there when it was dark outside so it's a year ago actually i started doing these videos in the winter i should look at the early dates uh, probably i think i showed some videos of the storms in november 2019 and they may be one of the first videos i started doing so i've been doing them for about a year now all right okay so my cat keeps me company all day. I've got the seagulls outside and we can see the water rippling. I'm on a boat. No, I'm not. I'm on my built in my studio, but it feels like we're on a boat. I hope someday when travel's possible again, we can have a lot of people come visit and look and have a studio tour, have a cup of tea. All right. So Vaughan Smith, Westcote Bell Pottery, .ca in Nova Scotia. Stay safe. 
and keep working. This will get us through the pandemic making pottery. It's such a great lucky thing we have. All right, take care. Bye-bye.